Well, good morning to the West Coast. Good afternoon to the East, everybody in between. Uh, my name is Brad Etheridge, and I am the Chief Marketing Officer for the Center for Tax Strategies and Resources. Really glad you're able to join us today. It is going to be a fascinating hour uh, spent with our main speaker, Bruce, Bruce uh, Gibner, as well as our founder, Simon Singer. Uh, for those of you that don't know much about the center, we're not an IMO, we're not a PPO, we're not a broker dealer, we're about education and folks can join our group, uh, what we like to refer to as a, a study group on steroids uh, and pick up a whole lot of ideas, concepts and techniques that can help increase your practice income. At this stage though, I want to introduce our founder, Mr. Simon Singer. For those of you that don't know Simon, he's been successfully in our industry since 1966. He's in the top one-tenth of 1% 1 of all producers in the U.S. Uh, and has written several business bestsellers, very sought after speaker, and uh, very, very passionate about coaching and mentoring in our industry. And with that, Simon, I will turn the mic over to you. Thank you, Brad. And just for those of you that don't know, my license number is one. Uh, so in any event, uh, the, the, the reason I started the center is when I started in this business in 1966, there was a lot of training and mentoring provided by major companies, uh, provided by the major producers that were affiliated with the major companies. And since this world has become basically a, a personal producing GA world, all that training seemed to have disappeared. So it seemed to me a couple of years ago that the industry's reputation is getting worse and worse. I decided I wanted to see if we could do something about bringing a, a greater level of professionalism and we were able to put together this think tank of 17 or 18 uh, permanent faculty members, members that, that help us educate uh, on technical things, on psychological things, on philosophical things, on strategies, uh, not so much on product. And uh, that's what one of our speakers today, Bruce Givner, is going to help us with. So let me tell you a little bit about Bruce. He's a, a tax attorney in West Los Angeles. Uh, he received his JD from the Columbia University Law School and an LLM in taxation from New York U uh, University's Graduate Law School way back in 1977. And Mr. Gibner has been favorably cited by both the U.S. Tax Court and the California Court of Appeals. He served as adjunct professor of Golden Gate. I'm getting tired of reading this. Uh, I think you're going to enjoy Mr. Gibner. Uh, he's very bright, very entertaining. Uh, we've been business associates now for over 30 years. So at this time, I'd like to turn it over to Mr. Givner, my friend, Bruce, take over. So welcome today. What we're supposed to talk about is the legislation that has been proposed. And then President Biden's, uh, he has not proposed legislation in a formal sense, but he has certainly talked about a number of things. So let's go through the things that uh, President Biden has talked about. And then we'll talk about two things that have actually been enunciated as bills, one by uh, Senator uh, Sanders and one by Senator Chris Von Hollen. So um, we're gonna talk about them. We'll make a few comments about the kind of planning that you can do if those things come about. And we're gonna certainly talk about the problems. But as an overall matter, um, what I say in the introduction is you have to have the right attitude. And there's a lot about that attitude. One is very good news, which is that life insurance, in my view, is a way to handle all of these things should they, be, should they come to pass. And I don't think they're going to come to pass because there's not enough votes in the Senate to enact any kind of major tax increases, whether they're ordinary income tax or estate taxes. But you're gonna have a lot of clients who reading these things are gonna be very afraid and very interested in talking to you about things they can do to reduce their tax bite, ordinary income, capital gain, estate tax. And as I said, life insurance is an answer to virtually all of those problems. So it is a salesman's opportunity here. Um, and one of the things Stuffy said years ago, which I still think is very funny, is, you know, someone gets up in the morning and says, you know, if I could only find someone to sell me $20 million of whole life insurance, my day would be complete. 
and that person calls up stuffing and says, ah, oh, what a shame. There is no more life insurance. It's all been sold. You're a day uh, late. Yep. And so uh, <laughs> I like that story. Okay, so let's deal with President Biden. So what has he talked about? Well, he's talked about increasing the ordinary income tax rate from 37% back up to 39.6%. That's not much of a big deal. Um, is it likely to happen? I don't think anything's going to happen in 2021, but you could see it as a minor change. So could it happen? Sure. I doubt it. Um, but the big surprise is this social security tax. Wow. What a change that would be right now. The 12.4% social security tax stops at $140,000. And what he's talked about, again, there's no proposal pending before Congress is that it would start again at $400,000 of earned income. Wow. So you see this big donut hole here, right? 12.4% up to 140 grand, nothing up to 400 grand. And then if you're taking salary over 400 grand, it starts again. Wow. That would be a big thing. So what do you think about that? Well, it's a radical change, but on the other hand, we need to do something about the social security looming deficit um, and so would something like that happen in the future? Eh, possibly, uh, but that's going to really alienate a whole lot of people. So what is this change in both the income tax rates and Social Security might that mean? Well, will C corporations be a lot more attractive in the future if personal rates go up? And the answer has to be yes. Uh, and will bailout techniques using life insurance be more attractive? Absolutely, right? I don't know if Mr. Singer is going to give a presentation at some point about the bailout technique he uses with C corporations and life insurance. Is that something you're going to do at some point, Mr. Singer? Actually, Bruce, I, I talked to our women woman uh, dentist client uh, earlier today about exactly that subject. Okay. I mean, is that you're going to, some of you're going to share with the members of the Center for Tax Resources and Strategies? I've, I've showed them the results of the transaction that we did with the doctor, uh -huh. starting, <laughs> starting with the pension plan and adding to that, but I haven't shown them the details because as you and I know, you don't want too much information getting right. to too many people too fast. But I think if they bring you a specific client with that situation, you'd be happy to show it to them in the context of a specific client, right? Uh, absolutely. So, you know, when you have a technique that uh, where you're comparing a 50% personal tax rate, and if it goes to 39.6%, it's going to be more than 50%. And below, we'll talk about how it could be 65%. Yep. So you could take 50% and reduce it to 38%. My goodness, Stuffy, if we have 65% and we can reduce it to 38%, it's even going to be that much better, isn't it? The bailout technique using I, whole I, life insurance. Let me, will be let me add and subtract those. Yeah, I think you're right. I think it'll be better. <laughs> it'll be even better, right? Yes. So, um, and of course, if the rate goes up, by definition, retirement plans are going to be more attractive. Uh, and we use bailout techniques using life insurance to take money out of retirement plans also. Have you talked to your members about that? I have talked to them about that and we will continue to talk about that. Right. And uh, you know, one of the things I say at the end of these materials is um, the law has changed on us in the past. It has taken away some of our tools in the past. We remember how many years ago was it Stuffy? 20 years ago, 25 years ago when there were springing cash value policies. You know, you pay a premium of 100,000 in years one, two, three, four, and five, $500,000. And at the end of year five, you could buy out the policy for $100,000. Actually, sometimes, sometimes even less. It's sometimes even less, but I'm saying, but you know, it was a pretty good deal, 100,000 against 500,000 and they took it away. And now we can't do that anymore, but now we can buy it out for uh, $200,000. And it's still a pretty good, it's not as good as it was, but it's still pretty good, right? And the fact that things aren't as good as they used to be doesn't mean they're still not attractive, right? right. So, um, and one of the things that we shouldn't omit is that you need to become more skilled about life insurance. Don't think of it only as a death benefit. Life insurance is an alternative asset class. 
And it's also a way to use uh, the tax shelter of an insurance policy to avoid ordinary income. And so as the income tax rates go up, the ability to put investments inside an insurance policy are that much more attractive. So remember, life insurance, there's only four tax shelters in the Internal Revenue Code. Charities, the money goes in deductibly, the money earns money income tax free, but when it comes out, you can't get it other than maybe a little salary. So charities are a tax shelter, they're just not that useful. Pension plans are, are a tax shelter. The money goes in tax deductibly, the money earns money income tax free, but when the money comes out, it's ordinary income. So the problem with pension plans is, you know, there's a limit on how much you can put in every year. Although we have ways to really juice it up. Yep. What's the other tax shelter? Well, number three is a charitable remainder trust. You get a deduction of some amount on the way in, the money earns money income tax free. But when the money comes out, it's basically ordinary income. The fourth tax shelter is life insurance. No deduction on the way in, no matter how many ways insurance agents have tried to come up with a deduction. By the way, the restricted property trust, which was created to try and get a deduction for a life insurance premium, the tax court just struck it down. Not that we needed the tax court to tell us that it didn't work, but there's no deduction on the way into an uh, insurance policy unless you buy it inside a pension plan, okay? You know, so, Bruce, you know, you know what I used to love about that one was the concept of uh, risk of forfeiture. Their risk of forfeiture was if you didn't make the next premium payment, you lost everything. Yeah. Well, guess what? That's kind of gone along for years. There's nothing <laughs> special about that. But how in the world that would be considered a risk of forfeiture, yes. one way, manner, shape, or form, I would have figured out how to pay that fifth premium payment. Yeah, when I first heard the restricted property trust, I, I had one simple reaction. No. <laughs> yeah. Remember, remember yeah. we remember we tried to get uh, a copy of the opinion letter that they claimed they had? Yes, and it never came quite never out. Came. It? Yep. The IRS has told you in French, Urdu, Pashto, Chinese, a Mandarin, you know, Hungarian, it's told you in every single way. You cannot get a deduction for the payment of a premium on, an, on a life insurance policy. And they keep trying to come up with stuff to do it, and it just doesn't work. But life insurance, once you get the money in there, once you get the asset in there, um, it's income tax free. Did, did I just lose you, Stuffy? No, I'm still here. Okay. mine. Uh, I just lost the visual of all of you guys. It says connecting to audio. Okay. Um, any event, life insurance is a tax shelter. Once you get the money in there, it grows income tax-free and every single way money comes out of life insurance policy, it is income tax-free. So you've gotta be clear how to exploit this phenomenal tax shelter. And well, we let, know let me also jump in and say, Mr. Givner is not licensed to sell life insurance. He's basically just telling you the realities of the tax code. Right, it is, Period. You, you've gotta understand the many, we use life insurance to make capital gains go away. We use life insurance to make passive income go away. We use life insurance to uh, for pre-immigration planning. There's all sorts of ways to use life insurance. Any event, um, so I get down on page two, you see uh, paragraph C impact, Roman numeral little four. The two provisions, which is the rate increase, the 39.6% and the 12.4% uh, social security. And if Congress does not um, eliminate, remember they removed the deduction for state and local taxes in excess of uh, $10,000. If that stays in effect, you can see in California, we will have a 65.3% rate in California for inco earned income over a million dollars. Wow, that is an, an eye-opening number. And that doesn't count the stuff we're about to talk about, how itemized deductions are going to be less valuable. So uh, I'm still with uh, President Biden. So one of the proposals is to limit itemized deductions. When you get a deduction, it won't reduce your taxes by 39.6% or 37%. It will be limited to 28%. So I say to you that life insurance, which is the only tax shelter for which contributions are not tax deductible, becomes more attractive. And you will use uh, life insurance to shift assets to generate 
passive income into the policy. Uh, and there's other deduction issues you'll see on the top of page three. Uh, and Bruce, Bruce, and while they're not deductible, the fact remains is, is when I move money from bank account A to bank account B, that's not deductible either. It's right. just a level playing field yep. on the contribution phase, but not on the accumulation and the distribution phase. Yep, very important. And the other one is if you're familiar with section 199 cap A, which is the qualified business income 20% deduction, uh, they're gonna phase that out. So uh, President Biden has uh, capital gains tax proposals. And the most shocking one is to basically double the tax rate on capital gains from 20% to 39.6% when your income is over a million dollars. Wow, that would be revolutionary. I get calls about that almost every day. They say, I wanna sell my property or my business today because I'm afraid if I wait, the capital gains tax rate will double. And I say, well, 25% of my practice is making capital gains goes, go away. And if we do that, it doesn't matter whether the rate's 20 or 39.6%. No, by the way, it's not gonna happen. Um, and um, another big revolutionary one is they want to eliminate the basis step up at death. Wow, would that be a big thing? Imagine the life insurance sales opportunities you get there. Because now if the children do not get a step up in basis, that means they're going to have a capital gain if and when they sell it. Now, for me, it's a great result because I have 20 ways to reduce, defer, or eliminate capital gains taxes. So there's gonna be a lot of demand for my services too, but it's a great insurance sale opportunity, okay? And, and by the way, one of the 20 ways to reduce, defer, or eliminate capital gains taxes is the use of life insurance. Very important to know that, especially when you've got an asset whose value is rapidly going up, uh, rapidly increasing. Life insurance is a great part of that technique. Okay, now let's go to the Sanders bill. So the Sanders bill, which is funny, uh, it was originally called the For the 99.5% Act, and then he renamed it For the 99.8%, the idea being that only 0.2% would be impacted by his bill. But if you read the bill, it's going to impact a whole lot more than 0.2%. Uh, and I, of course, call it the Life Insurance Agents Blank Dream Act but I didn't put that in writing. And you can fill in the blank, right? Is, is it one word in the blank or two words? Yes, it's one word, yeah. Okay. So the one of the big things about um, the Sanders bill, as opposed to the Van Hollen bill, is that the Sanders bill is prospectively effective. So it's effective basically for January 1st, 2022. When we get to the Van Hollen bill, it is retroactively effective to January 1st, 2021. So the idea is that Van Hollen put in a retroactive effective date. So it's already, if, if, it, if it's passed, which it won't be, if it's passed, it will be effective as of what? Four and a half months ago, January 1st. So the idea of that was to say, hey, we're, you know, freeze people from doing planning. And right now, you know, tax lawyers and CPAs are saying to the clients, hey, if you do this planning right now, we can't be certain that it is effective. So you have to warn the clients, oh my God, if this bill passes, maybe what we're doing today won't work, okay? So any event, so what is involved in uh, Bernie Sanders' bill? Uh, the first thing is the estate and gift taxes. He proposes to raise the rates and to lower the exclusion. So he's going to lower the exclusion immediately to three and a half million, not waiting till 2026 when it goes down to 6.4 million per person, allegedly. So at three and a half million dollars, you can see the rate would be 45%. Then over 10 million, it's 50 and over 50 million, it's 55%. And then for people like Brad Etheridge, it is 65% over a billion. So not many people are going to be hit by these 65% bracket. Um, but the 45% over three and a half million, that's a big number for a lot of people, certainly in our clientele. And you'll see also that the exemption for gifts is much smaller. It's only a million dollars during the lifetime. So that is going to impact the ability to do lifetime planning. Hence, again, life insurance, it's going to be easier to sell life insurance. 
So there's a lot of planning implications. I, I certainly don't know what they all are today. If this were to ever become law, you can be, a, you can be assured that all the bright minds in tax law, CPAs, insurance agents, money managers will come up with some very sophisticated planning. But at a minimum, if there is a 45% tax rate, a 50% tax rate, you can be sure that there will be some bracket splitting. In other words, I'm looking at item three, should the survivor um, have some tax, should there be some tax paid on the death of the first spouse? So that you have two estates in the 45% bracket instead of just the survivor's estate in the 50% bracket. That's a simple example. Should the survivor make a taxable gift to the heirs to start using up the survivor's million dollar exclusion? Should you be making annual gifts to stay under the million dollar gift threshold? In other words, lots of $15,000 gift exclusions. So now let's look what the planning is on a given dollar amount for husband and wife. So example one at the bottom of page four, imagine a married couple worth $10 million. Well, under the current law, Obviously, there's no tax with a $23,400,000 exclusion. And if you go to 2026, when it's supposed to go down, when it's the guess is it'll be $6.4 million per person, there's still not going to be an estate tax, okay? Well, under the Sanders proposal, the exclusion goes down to $3.5 immediately, and there would be a 45% estate tax on $6.5 million. That's a really big change. <laughs> This couple worth $10 million has an almost $3 million estate tax. That is a, an insurance sale opportunity, without so a doubt. Yeah, let, let me interrupt for a second. So let, let's add his qualified plan assets to these. And now we got 65% income tax, almost no exemption, and another 45% on the remaining 35%, yes? Well, sure, if, if 5 million of his 10 million is um, a retirement plan, right? So on that 5 million, um, the estate tax would be, let's say, it's not truly 45% because you have to ratio it against the whole thing. But let's say the average estate tax rate, rate would be 35% because it, it's an average over the whole 10 million. So let's say on you have 35% on 5 million. So what is that about a million seven? Okay. So what happens is, uh, against the five million of taxable income, you get a deduction of a million seven. But on the other 3.3, you're still going to pay 50% in income tax. Right? So what happens is on 3.3, you pay a million six of income tax and you've paid a million seven of estate tax. So what's the tax rate? <laughs> is that 75? Per, I, I don't know. Is it 68%? Some big number. Yeah. It's a big damn number. So Yes, it's going to be really bad. Now, if we go to an, I didn't do a whole bunch of examples, but if you take a family worth 20 million, okay, under current law, there's no tax at 23.4 million of exclusion. When you go forward to 2026, when the exclusion goes down, there's a $2.9 million tax. But under the Sanders proposal, it goes from 2.9 to $8 million. <laughs> That's a really big difference. And so, uh, I mean, there's a, there's a lot of insurance sales opportunities here. So that's the bracket uh, and the exclusion change under the Sanders bill. That would put us back into business doing estate tax planning in a very big way. Bradley, you got anything? Now, uh, Bruce, that just, that's amazing. And, and I, you know, what, what the center proposes to be is we're, we're education and action and the, uh, your words, especially in the last few minutes, I mean, those that are prepared to actually capitalize. And that's what we try to do at the center. And, and we certainly do it because of the uh, expertise of our faculty and you being uh, our, our primary one. So thank you for taking the time to go through that with everyone. I know you're gonna be at our uh, upcoming academy we have here in June. In a moment here, I'll kind of give everybody an update on how that works. And we'll get you a little bit more about the center itself. So Bruce, thank you so much. Uh, for jumping in here and uh, sharing with us this morning and uh, Simon for uh, helping uh, and actually starting the center to start with, it makes a big difference. Um, if you wanna learn more about the sales process and the alliances, tax laws and strategies, we do a virtual academy that's June 14th through 16th. 
Uh, it is an unbelievable amount of information that's covered over that three-day period, and I'll let you know a little bit more about the hours here in a minute. But I want to tell you a little bit about our expert uh, experts that we have, and folks like Bruce Givner, uh, our academy folks. We've got a superstar faculty. Bruce, as you just heard, will definitely be uh, at our event. Uh, Kevin Knebel, who is uh, the number one guy on the world's biggest Rolodex, uh, which is the whole LinkedIn platform. Uh, and also the number one sought after business speaker in the US. Simon that you heard here will be uh, covering multiple topics at the Academy. Uh, Joe Strazeri, who's a super bright uh, tax attorney, nationally recognized uh, creator of the Southern California Institute and Laureate program. Uh, and, and he'll come and share some uh, incredible ideas on how to capitalize on your practice. Uh, I won't go through all of them, but I mean, Curtis Cloak is the preeminent expert in maximizing tax and cash flow. Vince Dodano is the all-time producer at Guardian Life. Um, uh, Walt Dallas is a tax attorney who will talk specifically about how to review uh, client returns and a service that we have that's available to our members to uncover unnecessary taxes paid. Uh, Harold Dilemma, Senior Vice President of Financial Independence Group, Jeffrey Dunham, uh, Rick Jay, who is the national expert on uh, ESOPs and can actually explain them in a way that people can understand and realize what those huge tax advantages are. Uh, Jason Kirchner, Jerry Minardi, who's a co-founder of uh, Selling Technologies as a video vignette program. Uh, David McKnight, the author of The Educator and uh, the author of Power of Zero, who's one of our faculty members, will talk about maximizing retirement income. Uh, David Nesty, who is an amazing CPA, uh, that we're actually uh, working with them to help create programs to um, uncover unnecessary taxes paid for your clients. Uh, Mark Pace, who a lot of you know, national expert in life insurance policy management and also referral expert. Uh, Steve Pasek, who's a CPA uh, with his master's in taxation, does some tax reduction programs for our members and their clients. Uh, Don Pren, who's a senior board member for Insmark. Dr. Vicki Rackner will do a couple of sections with us. Uh, she is a retired surgeon who understands how physicians think, how to capitalize on that market and add them to your practice. Uh, John Wheeler, a member of an American College faculty on retirement planning, super, super uh, uh, intelligent guy and a great storyteller. Uh, Dan Zeppelin, who has a very unique senior settlement uh, program where he actually puts these policies up to bid. We've had some phenomenal experience with our members on uh, creating the most value uh, for those clients under those circumstances. Uh, so those and several more will be there. You can expect 18 takeaways from the Academy um, and you'll get actually more than 18, but the primary will be talking about reducing taxes in order to create clients. We think it is the number one way to uh, increase your practice size. Hardwired tax reduction plans prepared by experts. So you can go back and uh, open up new accounts by showing them uh, and reviewing their existing taxes and finding missed opportunities. Three ways to take over existing retirement plans that produce assets under management and increase your insurance sales. Um, you'll have the best comparison of both perm and, terminate life, uh, term and permanent life insurance. We're going to talk about it both. I'll give you a little bit of clue. I'll let permanent's better. A retirement plan that provides more retirement income than defined benefit plans and is tax-free. We'll talk about a uh, retirement plan that can provide health benefits that are also tax deductible and tax-free. We'll talk about a lead system that not only tells you who has retirement plans in your area, but how much is in them, what they're paying for their fees, what their yield is like, what their competition has, and you can actually identify prospects for asset takeover and looking at their 401ks in your backyard. Um, we also have marketing with customized short video vignettes through Jerry uh, Minardi, where you can white label videos that are sent right to your prospect and existing clients' cell phones with ideas and concepts that create sales opportunities for you. We'll talk about uh, number 10, which is one of my favorite, uh, computer systems that tell you which assets to access and what amount and in what time in order to maximize your income for doing what is coined as timing, combining, and sequencing. So you can get the most out of uh, their existing assets. Exit strategies from qualified plans that reduce income taxes and estate tax to find benefit plans that create guaranteed income, uh, how to get doctors and dentists and A clients with Dr. Vicki Rackner. Uh, we'll spend some time on that. Strategic partnerships with CPA firms and property and casualty agencies. Really go to, in other words, that, that program is, is really huge with us because it shows you how to get in front of the right kind of people under proper conditions and elevated, uh, elevating the relationship to assure you getting a, a sale and an engagement. 
multiple ways to convert IRAs, profit sharing, 401k to fund benefit plans to Roth IRAs, bunch of techniques we cover on that. Uh, potential career ending plans to stay away from. Bruce has been big at helping us identify those things and we always talk about those at the Academy. Expert legal and accounting resources to help <clears throat> educate you on sophisticated strategies and orchestrating engagements and closed business because hey, we do like to get paid for what we do. And uh, also we'll talk quite a bit about the Southern California Institute Education and their presentation library. It's really interesting how in the last 30 years, we've gone from uh, estate planners to income tax planners, to pension planners, to capital gains planners, back to income tax, back to estate tax. The, the, the definition of permanent is until the next Congress meets. Yes, of course. That's uh, Will Rogers. No man's fortune is safe as long as Congress is in session. Absolutely. Um, yes, we keep changing. I mean, I, in my first seven years of practice, I probably did 80% pension plans. And then I switched and there was a time period when I did nothing but income tax plan because tax shelters were very hot until the 86 Act. Uh, in any event, so the next swipe at estate tax planning is to eliminate valuation discounts. Well, that will be very significant because our go-to strategy, our practice is about 80% wealthy real estate families because we're in West Los Angeles and most people in West LA, you know, who are worth 10 million, 100 million, 500 million, it's all real estate. Well, the first thing we do is put the real estate into a family limited partnership to get the 40% discount for lack of marketability, lack of control. And then from there, we do the other stuff, whether it's a skin, a private annuity, sale to a grant or a trust, um, part gift, part sale. You're, so, you're going you're gonna to get to sale to grant or a trust, right? Well, <laughs> we'll see if they still have that after the Van Halen. Exactly. Um, so the fam if you lose the 40% discount for the family limited partnership, guess what financial instrument is going to benefit from the loss of that discount? Can you imagine in a million years, Mr. Singer, what financial instrument will benefit from that? Hmm. Does it start with an L? Yes, it does start with an L. Yes. I got it. Okay. I think I got it. You got it. Right. And life insurance will benefit because we know, and we're not going to be talking about generational split dollar right now, but we know with GSD, we can get a 60%, 70%, 80%, 90%, 95% discount if you use GSD. And what it's going to do is it's going to force people to buy the split, do the split out of life insurance many, many years earlier than they would have otherwise done. Because what you're going to want to do is do it with a 60 year old so that we can get rid of it by the time the person is 70 years old. So when they die at 90, there will be no evidence whatsoever that the GSD was ever done. That's what you're going to want to do is get rid of it many, many years in advance. Usually now people come to us and they're in their 80s and we say, well, we can get you a really big discount with GSD. And they say, okay, let's do it but they're so close in time to the filing of the 706 that, mm, you know, the IRS is going to be looking at it and the IRS hates GSD. Now we get a pretty good result on audit, but mm, you'd rather do it for a 60 year old and then you can get rid of it sometime over the next decade. Now he's 70, lives another 20 years. What a great result. So a lot more life insurance will be sold if valuation discounts are eliminated. And how many of those? How many of those would you say that we've done? Twenty, yeah. something like that. But but you make a lot of money on those things, so you don't need to do too many, right? Yeah. It, 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 however, it it's complex and it needs to be done very complex. carefully and efficiently. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, those you know the legal fees on those run a hundred to two hundred grand, um, and, and so they are complex transactions. But if you're getting a 50, 60, 70, 80, 90 percent discount, you know, the money's no object in terms of legal fees because the result is just humongous. Yeah, 25 million of tax savings on a 50 million dollar estate is probably worth a couple of hundred thousand dollars. Yep, absolutely. So those are the big three. Rate, increase, um, exclusion, decrease, valuation, discount, elimination. Wow. Okay, now we go to grants. Grants are grant or retained annuity trusts are very important, especially if you're using stock of an S corporation, because that's how we make S corporations disappear for estate taxes. Doesn't matter how valuable the business is. If you've got stock of an S corporation, we should be able to make it disappear in 
five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten years. Okay. Well, they're dramatically proposing to, they're proposing to dramatically change the rule for grats in a way to make them basically unusable for S corporations in many situations. Um, the grat has to be at least ten years. That's not really a big deal necessarily. Um, it, you're not going to. Uh, it's it can't be longer than the grantor's life expectancy. That's not a big deal. The problem is number three. The taxable remainder has to be at least twenty five percent. Well, if you got a if you've got only a three and a half million dollar exclusion, so you got a single parent, and the business is worth thirty million dollars. Uh, you're going to have a problem because that means when you do the grat, seven and a half million, 25% minus three and a half million, it's $4 million. You got to pay a gift tax on four and a half. No, actually the gift tax exclusion is only going to be $1 million. You'd have seven and a half minus one is six and a half million times a 45% rate. Uh, that's not going to work. So this, this could be really devastating for us corporations. Grantor trusts. This is really interesting. And this would be devastating to a lot of estate tax planning. It says grantor trust will be included in the grantor's estate. Wow, that's gonna be a big problem because we use grantor trust in all estate tax planning. Once you set up the family limited partnership and you get your 40% discount when you're dealing with real estate, the next thing you do is you sell the limited partnership interest to a grantor trust for the benefit of the good for nothing children. So let's say you got $10 million of real estate, you discount it, it's now worth 6 million. Now what you're doing is you're selling ultimately all $6 million of limited partnership interest to a grantor trust for the benefit of the children. Why is it a grantor trust? Because we don't wanna have any gain recognition on that $6 million. But if you sell it to the grantor trust for the benefit of the children and the grantor trust is included in your Grantor's estate, you've accomplished absolutely nothing. So now change it. Okay, you say, all right, it's got to be a complex trust. Well, if it's a complex trust, that means gain is recognized. Well, okay, all right. So we sell it for ten percent down. And Bruce, let me let me let me interrupt for a second. Yep. Gain is recognized by the trust as opposed to the grantor, right? No, the grantor. No. So what happens is if you have to sell it to a complex trust, as that's what I mean. Trust. I'm sorry. So now the grantor sells it, let's say for $6 million. So let's say there's a 10% down payment. Okay, you got to pay tax on the 10% down payment. But now the children's trust paying on the note. So basically, it's going to have to be an interest only note. Got to be an interest only note, because if you're amortizing that note, every amortization is going to be capital gain back to the parent. I mean, that's not necessarily the end of the world but it's not a great result. And you're certainly not gonna be able to use private annuities. So that's gonna be the killer. You're gonna to have to do it for an installment note interest only. You won't be able to use a private annuity because a private annuity by definition, every payment is capital gain, ordinary income and return of capital. Wow, that'll blow out private annuities, which is one of my go-to techniques to make the estate go to zero. Wow, that'll wipe out private annuities. Oh boy. All right, moving on, uh, Senator Sanders proposes to limit GST exemption planning to 50 years, and it is not prospectively effective. It is retroactively effective. So let's say your client set up a, a dynasty trust in 1990. That means 2000, 2010, that means in 20 years, that dynasty trust ends and will be subject to tax. Wow, that's another sale opportunity. No grandfathering at all. And finally, a very interesting one is if you set up an insurance trust, the maximum number of annual exclusions is two. So imagine you set up a policy and the policy needs, you know, $90,000 of premium each year. What are you going to do about the other 60,000? You're going to have to have... Yeah, you're, you're going to go to, to the lifetime exemption first, but if that's only a million bucks. Right. You're going to be using up your lifetime exemption. So it's going to put a premium on, I shouldn't use the word premium. It's going to put an onus on you to put income producing assets into the insurance trust or to not use insurance trust, to use partnerships. So you don't have to worry about crummy 
powers and you know annual exclusion gifts. So that's very interesting. Anyway, that's Sanders' bill. Van Hollen's bill is is different. First of all, it's retroactively effective. That's a problem. I think it's dead on arrival, but that's that's a problem. If it if you know, remember what the twenty the pollsters in twenty sixteen said Hillary Clinton would be elected president. The pollsters in twenty twenty said the Democrats would would have. 53 seats in the current Senate. And they, the pollsters in 2020 said the Democrats would pick up 15 seats in the House. None of those predictions took place. None, none of those predictions came true. So I'm hitting, sitting here telling you none of these proposals are going to pass in 2021. <laughs> There's no basis for saying that what I'm saying is correct, right? All of these things could happen. I'd be very surprised. Obviously, Joe Manchin who's from a state that Trump carried by 39%, is unlikely to vote for a massive tax increase. In addition to Joe Manchin, there is John Tester. John Tester is a Democrat senator from Wyoming. Trump carried Wyoming by 16%. John Tester is not going to be voting for a massive tax increase. There are other examples of that, but there's eight weak senators from, who are Democrats that are just unlikely to vote for massive tax increases. But I could be wrong, any event. So uh, the first uh, and probably the major point of Van Hollen's bill is a new Internal Revenue Code Section 1261. And it is shocking in its um, reach because basically there is a forced recognition of the gain in an asset that's appreciated in certain transactions, namely gifts. So if you make a gift, let's say you've got an asset worth $10 million with a basis of a million dollars and you transfer it to a non-grantor trust, you recognize the $9 million of gain. What? Where did that come from? Uh, and if you transfer it to a grantor trust, which is our normal trust, that's what we do in estate tax planning. We set up non-grant, we set up grantor trusts, trusts that are disregarded for income tax purposes. And we want them excluded from the parent's estate. Well, he's not getting rid of grantor trusts that are excluded from the parent's estate. He's just saying, if you transfer appreciated property to a grantor trust that's excluded from the parent's estate, no problem, you can do that, but oh, you've got $9 million of capital gain. What? <laughs> that's a very big change in the law. I mean, that's gonna kill I don't know, all estate tax planning? Obviously, we don't know what that means yet, but that's a big, big change in the tax law. That is, an, that is a nuclear bomb, okay? Now, there are exceptions. If you transfer it to a grant or trust that's included in the parent's estate, then it doesn't recognize, but, but why would I do that? <laughs> why would I transfer to a grant or trust that's included in the parent's estate? We don't use... There is a grant or trust that's included in the parent's estate. Their revocable living trust is a grant. Why would I do that? That doesn't make any sense. Um, transfers to charities, including a CRT, transfers to a trust for the spouse. But it's a devastating provision, devastating. And there's an, ex there's a, an exception for up to 500,000 for a personal residence and a million dollars during your lifetime. So, million dollars during your lifetime wipes out virtually all taxpayers. So most taxpayers aren't going to be affected, but all of our clients would be affected. So um, you do get a deduction for the income taxes that you pay against the estate tax. Uh, and now here's another bomb. It's just a huge bomb. This comes from Canada, by the way. If you have assets in a trust, an irrevocable complex, no, an irrevocable trust of any kind, the assets are deemed to be sold every 21 years. What? Say that again. If you have appreciated assets in an irrevocable trust, every 21 years, they're deemed to be sold, meaning there's a recognition event every 21 years. Have you ever heard of anything like that before, Mr. Singer? The, 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 the 21 years has familiarity, but not with regard to taxes. You know, with regard to copyrights and things of that nature, but with, re no, with regard to drinking age, maybe, but <laughs> but so I mean, it's amazing. Every 21 years, you look and you have to report the trust to the IRS every year so they can keep track of the age. But when it hits 21 years, 
boom, all the assets are deemed sold. You have to pay the tax. That is a wealth tax. It, it's essentially a wealth tax. So you got $10 million of assets in a trust, $1 million a basis, 21 years, 9 million a capital gain. Boom. That's a pretty big thing. And by the way, what if they double, what if they double the capital gains tax to 39.6%? You think there'll be a lot of assets sold every 21 years? By the way, is that a life insurance sale opportunity? Of course it is. You can put money away in a tax-free vehicle like a life insurance policy, and now you can borrow on it 21 years later to pay the tax. Wouldn't that be an, an insurance sale opportunity? But that's that's just an, uh, a bomb. It's an absolute bomb. Um, so that's it. Biden, big income tax, big... Uh, I mean, lots of big changes of Sanders bill, lots of big changes, Von Hollen, you know, nuclear bombs in his proposal. So what are, what are your conclusions on these things? Well, my conclusions are most of them are dead on arrival. I'm on the bottom of page, I'm on page eight. Certainly in 2021, I wouldn't expect to see any of them um, enacted. If there is a change in 2021, maybe the Republicans could agree to increasing the corporate tax rate from 21 to 25 percent, maybe, but I'd be surprised. Uh, Senator McConnell has said he's 100 percent devoted to making sure that nothing President Biden has proposed will become law. I'd probably take him at his word. <laughs> I, think, I think he means that, you know. Um, might some of them happen in 2022? Maybe, but I'd be surprised if uh, Manchin and Tester and Kristen Sinema of Arizona are gonna wanna jeopardize their chances of reelection by voting for some massive tax increase. Then you look well, that, at 20- 20... that's, that's being awfully cynical, Bruce. I mean, you're, you're, you're discounting that these guys might really wanna do something that might be in the best interest of the country just so they could get reelected. Well, I, mean, I don't, I, I think- Who ever heard of such a thing? I don't think Joe Manchin believes that a tax increase is in the best interest of the country. And I, don't I don't think he cares. I'm sorry? I said, I don't think he cares. Well, I mean, he's in a state that Trump carried by 39%. I mean, that's gotta be a definite no to, I think any tax increase. And I, if I'm wrong, I mean, you know, you got John Tester, yeah, one of the Democrats that the senators who's up for re-election in 2022, won her, I think it's Masson, uh, Maggie, uh, I, I, I'm not sure of the name, won her last race by 0.1%. She's up for re-election in 2022. Do you think someone who won her last race by 0.1% is going to want to vote for something as controversial as a tax increase? I mean, that just seems like a real hard no. So um, will the Democrats gain seats in 2022? I doubt it. Will they gain seats in the Senate in 2022? I doubt it. I mean, it's possible, but history tells us no, uh, that the party who has the White House loses seats in midterm elections. I don't know for sure. I'm just telling you that's what history says. Um, however, for the people in our audience, the fear of these changes, just the fear, the fact that they're being publicized is causing people to do things. We are getting people coming to us, not physically, because everything's done by Zoom right now, but people coming to us now and are spending money on good quality planning because of fear of these kinds of changes happening. It's generating capital gains planning work for us. It is generating big time estate tax planning work for us. And it's certainly generating passive income tax planning for us. And some of that stuff is definitely involving life insurance. And it should be generating that kind of openness by your clients for you to buy life insurance policies. So, But it's, but it's fairly complicated too, though, Bruce. So uh, I, I would suggest that there's, there's danger out there for the average licensed insurance agent uh, trying to do things that they're not qualified to do. Well, they may not know the way to sell the insurance for the capital gain and the way to sell the insurance to take advantage of these new opportunities for uh, mitigating step up and loss of step up and basis, uh, the forced sale of the assets in an irrevocable trust every 21 years, uh, and certainly how to get rid of passive income taxes. But 
the opportunities are there. And what I conclude with is, um, if you think about poker, okay, say you were playing uh, poker with Amarillo Slim or uh, Johnny Negreanu. I'm trying to think, I think that's his name. Say you were sitting at a table with two or three world-class poker players and you say, oh my goodness, you know, they got such a big advantage over me. I know, let's, let's make um, one-eyed jacks wild and that'll make it easier for me because there'll be more chances to get an ace. And, you say, and, and the answer, no, that doesn't help you. <laughs> If you make the game more complicated, the people who have the advantage are the experts. Johnny Negrano just got a really big advantage over you if you make one-eyed jacks uh, wild cards. Amarillo Slim just got a really big advantage over you if you make the rules more complicated. And so my point is that when the rules are stable for a long period of time, what happens is idiots can catch up to the experts. If the rules stay stable over time, the experts lose some of their advantage because the idiots, after years and years and years of going to seminars, eventually they can catch up. The distance between the idiot and the expert diminishes over time. But as soon as you shake up the rules, the idiots go like this. They've lost their, they've lost their firmament. They've lost their foothold. And now the experts are back up here again because the experts can easily take in these new rules and say, yeah, no, I see how that relates. Oh, yeah, sure. I, I get how that relates to what we used to do. Or I understand the new rules. And so the experts are up here and the idiots drop down like this again. And it's going to take them years to start creeping back up. So when the rules change, you get a bigger advantage if you are an expert. And so this is the time to pay attention to the changes in the rules because it will make you more money. It will put the uneducated further and further behind. So the education you can get from the Center for Tax Resources and Strategies will give you a bigger marginal advantage over other people. Now, some people just walk away and you know give up. I remember Stuffy uh, back in... Uh, in 1986, I was at a, a meeting and uh, we were talking about whether they would, uh, I'm trying to think, oh, whether they were going to repeal the estate tax. That's what it was. And one of the lawyers there said, God, I hope they repeal the estate tax. I can retire and eliminate all my malpractice. <laughs> and, you know, there are people who retire when the law changes because they're just afraid to learn all the new rules. But if that's not your attitude, you say, I'm going to master this stuff. Um, the advantage goes to you. So I hope that was helpful. Um, there's lots more to, to learn about these new rules if they ever happen. But right now, if you understand them, uh, you can use them to your advantage in selling to worried clients today. You know, Bruce, um, I believe it was in January of 2018. Uh, uh, Trump's tax law was 2017, became effective in 2018. Yep. Uh, where you were speaking at, at one of our meetings and you you mentioned uh, the 21 percent, which I hadn't realized. And uh, because years and years ago, we used to bifurcate practices, uh, medical practices and and split them into pieces. And then what added to that is you provided me with an asset protection trust. And I'm going, well, wait a second. Why can't we put these pieces together? and come out with a hole that's significantly greater than the sum of its parts. And you cocked your head and you went, yeah, we could do that. And all of a sudden there was a very happy physician who saved about $400,000 annually in taxes. Um, so- And that's because you had context and history, which you put together. Agreed. agreed. You were able to take a new rule and you were able to use it with your, your historical knowledge and experience and say, aha, I know how to work with this rule. Well, at least I said, I think I know how to work with this. Right. And, and then we had a lot of conversations about it. And lo and behold, it became available. Now, we told the doc at the time, we don't know how long this is going to last, but it's going to last for a couple of years until the second election. But now it's, he's now in his fourth year, and that's almost $2 million of tax savings. 
It's 220,000. No, no way would I have been able to do that without having um, the supreme confidence in you and you having the supreme confidence in uh, with the CPA and what's a client going to do when all of a sudden all the advisors are in agreement? Yep, and it's 220,000 per million. Yep. It's a big number. And exactly. Bradley, you got anything? <laughs> 